Hi, I'm Ruthanna Fouts, Director at TU Automotive, and we're here today at Insurance Telematics Europe. And with me right now is Ewan Parry, and he is the Programme Development Director at the Transport Research Laboratory. So welcome, Ewan. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's good to have you here again. You've been with us for a few years now, haven't you, at this I event? Have indeed, yes. So seeing the progression of, of, of UBI moving forward and That's into different right. phases. Yep. So what exactly is the role that you guys play in this marketplace? Well, TRL, uh, fundamentally a, a research consultancy organisation, mm -hmm. Uh, we're working on a whole range of different uh, areas of transport mobility, from mm -hmm. autonomous driving through to understanding the effectiveness of ADAS systems, understanding the, uh, the road safety implications of, uh, of new technologies, advising governments and advising the European uh, Commission about uh, future right. regulation. Um, so we have a role of, of uh, advising government and understanding these technologies, but we're also using a lot of that knowledge, knowledge around behavioural change, knowledge around uh, accidents, vehicle testing, collisions, okay. to uh, help the, the telematics industry uh, to deliver solutions that are, uh, are really uh, using the best knowledge that's available and, and addressing particular issues that, that is uh, within the market on the basis of the type of quality of information that's generated by telematics at the, at the moment. Okay. So is that telematics in general or is it specific to the insurance market? Uh, so this could be telematics within the fleet sector, okay. could be telematics within the insurance market and we're doing data analysis within the fleet sector looking at uh, the relationship between uh, risk indicators, uh, uh, driver uh, performance, uh, vehicle type, training, uh, bringing together very wide ranging data sets okay. to identify which sort of uh, risk indicators are, are really driving the, the, the a greater relationship to risk and, and therefore addressing those with the right kind of behavioural interventions. Okay, I see. Now one of the things we wanted to talk about today really was looking at like ADAS services because that's the next phase I guess and there's new technologies coming into the car more rapidly than we've seen really in recent history or you know, since the, the development of the production line almost yeah. you know, is what we're hearing being thrown around. Mm -hmm. Um, so how are ADAS services going to affect motor insurance specifically or, you know, there's, there's lots of questions around yeah. it. Well, ADAS first of all uh, primarily is, is uh, being introduced in order to deliver uh, improved safety for, mm -hmm. for uh, vehicles and their occupants and, and other road users. Uh, so the impact on uh, insurance is primarily going to be um, the extent to which those systems reduce crash exposure and, of and uh, risk, risk um, of claims. Um, some of the other impacts that uh, these systems might uh, introduce are things like uh, providing OEMs with new sources of uh, information mm -hmm. uh, the, in, in order to enable uh, ADAS systems. We need um, very uh, you know, sophisticated sensors uh, on the vehicles that are uh, tracking data in a, in a range of different modes, so uh, uh, LiDAR, um, cameras, uh, and other types of uh, radar sensor, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and this information, when combined with very high fidelity driver information that, that the uh, vehicle can uh, pick up from driver controls, mm -hmm. gives us a, a, a source of, uh, of telematic type information which is, which is uh, far in excess of what can be provided by a, a box in the car at the moment. Right. And I think it's, it's recognised that this is, is significantly uh, uh, beneficial for the OEMs to be uh, in, in uh, control of that data and therefore there is uh, potential knock-ons within the uh, insurance sector as a result of, uh, sort of uh, perhaps an asymmetric uh, access to, to data about um, the, the people who are driving vehicles. Mm -hmm. Um, something I've just thought of is about, you know, mentioning about the sensors and obviously with the telematic side of things specifically, it's all about monitoring the situation and the scenarios that are occurring through the driver behaviour. Mm -hmm. We're talking a lot about claims here as well today and the claims is about, you know, the data on the vehicle, how they've driven, what action they've taken. Mm -hmm. If we've now got all this data coming in from LIDARs, radars, you know, cameras, looking at the environment around us to be safer, to react. I mean, could that data, or are insurers looking at integrating that data into usage-based insurance policies as well to make more accurate pricing mm. or more accurate you know, claims decisions? Yeah, I, I think the issue is going to be access to that information. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment we have vehicles with uh, very sophisticated systems on board already. You know, um, 
uh, not even including what's going to come on board with increasingly more sophisticated mm. ADAS systems. Um, uh, but currently that information is not uh, available to be used okay. um, uh, through normal telematics. So, so a normal telematics box would measure its own data, provide yeah. that to an insurer. A car will measure its own data and, and, and use that information to get mm -hmm. the driving of the car right. Um, and I think the, the, the question is to what extent those things are going to merge uh, could, and, and who controls the data. Mm. And, and that's going to be a very important um, uh, dynamic, I think, that will work out over the next um, few years. Um, I think the point about claims and where this data comes in in terms of the, the, the claims piece is, is actually, again, ownership of data, but also um, what information is recorded by the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, this, so this really comes to uh, event data recording within the vehicle, and there are, there is uh, a, a number of different ways that that might be done. Um, so we have uh, standards in the, the United States at the moment, Part 563, which, mm -hmm. which gives us a, a data standard for event data recorders in vehicles where we get airbag deployment or near airbag deployment. Um, I, I think as we get increasingly sophisticated ADAS systems, um, the requirements there might well change, particularly as we move th forward to autonomy or increasingly autonomous systems that are making decisions about changing the movement of a vehicle mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, that are uh, intervening in a driving situation. And in that situation, for various reasons, for product liability, we're going to want to make sure that the of vehicle course. was performing as uh, it was uh, intended to. Um, from a legal point of view, um, uh, from, a, from a, 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 both a criminal and a civil point of view, uh, we're also going to be interested in that data um, uh, and the, the potential contribution or not of a, of a vehicle system to the circumstances of a particular incident. So that event data is going to become very important within a vehicle um, to, uh, to validate the performance of the systems and to right. understand where the driver behaviour stopped and the vehicle okay. behaviour took over. That's going to be a very interesting question because that is going to be central to some of the, the claim scenarios that might arise mm -hmm. um, from, uh, from these types of vehicles. At the moment, I don't see a way in which that information is going to be easily accessible to insurers, that, that high quality information, yeah. um, because it is going to be a, a sort of vehicle fixed um, mm. uh, set of data. Well, we're seeing a, a few more partnerships for interest from the automakers to build partnerships with insurance carriers as they start to embed these products, mm. which is obviously a natural kind of progression of these technologies. So I guess we might have some access at some point, but yet to be seen. But you mentioned that obviously about autonomy and we moved on. I know that you, know, you guys are involved in the Greenwich project, which is obviously an exciting project that's happening here, obviously in London and in the UK. That's right. Um, about autonomous vehicles and getting them on the roads and generating the data and mm -hmm. testing and certifying the systems. I mean, can you tell us more about that project and yeah. what it means? Yeah, Gateway, um, as with, with uh, the other projects in the UK that are going on at the moment, is about understanding the, the impacts of uh, bringing autonomous vehicles into uh, into public spaces and into the mm -hmm. public consciousness. So uh, we're looking to, to uh, demonstrate the vehicles, but also understand the, the way in which uh, people uh, interact with the vehicles, mm -hmm. the way in which uh, they perform. Uh, we want to generate new, new knowledge within uh, the businesses that are engaged in the project. Um, so uh, we have uh, insurers engaged, we have uh, uh, energy suppliers, we have technology developers. Uh, and, and research institutions as well. And it, we, we can generate new knowledge which is beneficial to, to UK PLC there. Uh, we also want to create um, a testing environment mm -hmm. within uh, Greenwich which can bring in new technologies, uh, create an environment in which we can evaluate and test uh, these vehicles in the future um, to, to provide new opportunities in, in, in that area as well. And I think it's, uh, it's a really interesting project being based in London. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at uh, the heart of uh, you know, our, our own, only uh, mega city, global exactly. mega city here in, in the UK. So I think it's really important that these vehicles are tested in that type of environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that we, uh, you know, as, as uh, a country, are able to take advantage of the, um, the opportunities that a move towards greater autonomy uh, is creating. And, and, and I think that the, this project will be central to that. Yeah, and I think it's, it's like you say, it's extremely exciting that it's happening kind of on, on the doorstep as well. And yeah, mega cities are where the need for less congestion is required, and obviously this is a step towards them. Exactly. Yeah, if, if we look at the, the, um, the sort of. Uh, 
the roadmap that we, we see for introducing these sorts of technologies, um, certainly kind of primarily highway-based technologies, we see various levels of automation mm -hmm. coming in. We talked about ADAS, and, and that'll get us up the, uh, uh, the levels in terms of increasing autonomy, and we will start to see uh, fully autonomous systems on, on highways when the legislative framework is in place uh, to allow that. But actually in the urban environment, I think we're going to see something slightly different. Rather than this creeping autonomy, we, we will potentially start seeing autonomous systems, which okay. are kind of level five, uh, level four, level five autonomy, um, where level four is around defined use cases uh, of, uh, of these vehicles. And, and I think that, it, that there'll be a different way in which, which within that city environment, uh, mm -hmm. uh, these vehicles can be deployed in, in a shorter term, potentially, than those fully autonomous vehicles out on the highway. Um, exactly, I think that's interesting given the amount of press that we're currently seeing in the mainstream media about autonomous vehicles. Mm. And I think it's an easy um, kind of decision to make when you're reading these, that these vehicles are going to be the replacing or replacing the, how we use vehicles today, rather than creating other ways in which vehicles can you know, help society or be useful within society. Mm. So looking at different use cases that you know, what, what are you kind of looking at at the moment? So obviously it's not just replacing your owned car that we're seeing at the Greenwich Project. Yeah. You know, what's the use case that's actually um, being tested there and what other use cases do you think these vehicles could really add value to rather than just replace a current system that, perfect, that works perfectly yeah. well? Well, I think first of all, um, the, 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 the fundamental here is that we're in a, in a period of great opportunity mm. and change within uh, within mobility and, and that's being uh, that's being created through this uh, development of technology and the way in which the technology can integrate with the transport environment so we see you know apps and we see disruptive things like, like um, uber and, and yeah. halo you know occurring um, and uh, we're, this is happening at the same time as obviously a, a, a generation is coming into uh, the, the mobility demand uh, sector where, where um, there's a different level of expectation mm -hmm. about what technology might do for them yeah. in terms of their mobility. Um, so there's changing attitudes and, and changing attitudes will, will drive different changes in different types of solution. In terms of what will come about in terms of those, those mobility solutions, clearly we have Great, a lot of a lot of interest in car sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're potentially disconnecting individuals from the asset of a, of a vehicle, of which, which is uh, has in interesting implications from a, uh, from an insurer's perspective. Um, and as I said earlier, with the, uh, the the level four, level five autonomy of systems within the urban environment, potentially we have the opportunity to to kind of even disrupt that model uh, yeah. uh, further as well. Um, so use cases uh, in areas of Greenwich at the moment, we're, we're really looking really to start touching on some of those uh, mobility trends and some of the, uh, the potential first applications within, yeah. within urban environments. And, and one of those is a, is a you know, mobility system for an autonomous mobility system within a uh, sort of largely recreational area around the, 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 uh, the Greenwich uh, Peninsula, but which will also uh, include into residential areas um, and, and connect different parts of, of yeah. the peninsula as much as possible. So um, that, that initial uh, uh, piece of work we're doing, we're looking at, at that kind of connectivity and, and managing that connectivity, okay. providing that kind of service. Uh, that mobility service, that local mobility service to uh, to individuals. But then we've been moving on to other things. And one of the things we might well be looking at is um, uh, local deliveries uh, and, and how autonomous systems can be can start integrating within within a commercial uh, vehicle mm -hmm. uh, sense of, of uh, delivering items within within that kind of community uh, area. Um, and uh, uh, another area we're also looking at is uh, is the autonomous parking. Uh, and also uh, looking at the way in which we can uh, interact with a vehicle, with an autonomous vehicle, that needs some kind of intervention. Um, so we anticipate this future where there are uh, level four um, autonomous vehicles providing okay. services, uh, mobil mobility services. At some point, we believe that, that those types of vehicles might need some kind of human intervention from a remote source. So we're looking okay. at, at the option of doing that. Uh, with the vehicles that we have uh, within the Gateway project. And we think that that will um, really assist the, any questions there are around uh, the development of autonomy, where um, 
it, it could be derailed, as it were, by uh, some kind of inability to be able to deal with certain specific situations. What we want to do is prove that, we, that, that there is a, mm -hmm. a way to, to, to get over those uh, kinds of uh, um, situations by some kind of uh, human intervention, but doing it safely and, and predictably and reliably okay. um, uh, over a remote connection. You mentioned earlier, just jumping back to something you said earlier about um, how people interact with these vehicles. Mm. And there's a lot of conversation going on around the market at the moment about the different cultures and how they're going to be, they're going to react differently. So some, some people will just love to jump out in front of these vehicles yeah. and test them, which is going to then cause obviously stoppages and then mm -hmm. delays. I mean, what are the other kind of potential hazards that, you know, the, the human factor can throw into play with these vehicles that, I mean, this is obviously a question where there's no answers, because yeah, who knows, yeah. but the hypothesis around it's quite interesting. It's part of the point of, mm. of getting them out there and, and trying and, and uh, understanding uh, how people how people interact with these is, is very much part of what we want to investigate as part of this, this mm -hmm. work, part of the research is to really understand that that behavioural interaction with autonomous vehicles. So you're absolutely right, you know, I, I fully expect people to, to stand in front of an autonomous vehicle and, and, and make it stop, yeah. uh, which is what it's supposed to do in that situation, fantastic. Um, but then the, the, the question really is what, what happens as a sort of cultural response to that? And, and uh, you know, we've seen uh, the introduction of autonomous vehicles in other places. This isn't the first place where these vehicles have been uh, trialled on a fairly, fairly small scale in, in, in other parts of the world and then other cultures driving those behaviours. But, you know, in, in the US, um, uh, one example was from uh, one of the, the, uh, the campuses out, uh, out in Silicon Valley where it, uh, autonomous vehicles were introduced and uh, only operating over a relatively small uh, area, mm -hmm. but in a very busy pedestrian context as well. And, and I think what was found there was that there was quite a lot of interaction with the vehicles, interaction in terms of stopping vehicles yeah. and, and uh, uh, you know, trying to see uh, the extent to which uh, they were really <laughs> safe around pedestrians. Um, uh, but actually what, what happens initially is that that kind of inquisitive behavior uh, happens. Mm. Uh, and then you know what? Well, after people shout at you in the in the, in, in the vehicles a little bit, and it, you know people just think, oh, yeah. I'm not going to bother doing that anymore. It's uh, you know it, it, it comes every day. It becomes you know the adrenaline rushes. Is, is exactly, annoying, and it's, it? it'll be like you know people pushing every button in the lift. You know, yeah. it's a bit socially so socially unacceptable yeah. thing to do. You know, it might be funny once or twice, but but it is. It, yeah, it, I think we, we'll find that. That's, that's the expectation okay. perhaps, but you know, need, these things need to be tested for us to be sure. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that, that's it's not the whole point of the, of the, no. uh, of the, of, of the research, but, but it's the same. sort of thing we, we would uh, expect to observe and, and, uh, and comment on. And, and equally, you know, other, other types of behaviours. So how do people behave when they're on board the vehicle? Mm. You know, what, what sort of uh, behaviours there in terms of the, the Meridian shuttle? Uh, clearly, it's quite an open environment. Yeah. If you've seen the pictures of the of the shuttle, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we'd expect people to be re behaving responsibly in that environment. Of course, we we, we need to, to to see if that's the case, yeah. and, and to see how the vehicles um, are used, them, how easy it is to get get on and off them, mm -hmm. how how easy it is to understand where the vehicle's going next. You know, if you if you're getting on with, with yeah, if there's no eye others. contact with the driver, and exactly, there's nobody to ask. You know, it, so so. Um, uh, and we're going to be tracking these things. We've got some quite innovative ways uh, to be tracking the, the sentiment that, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, is being expressed by the people who are using uh, the, 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 the shuttles and, and those that are interacting with it um, uh, outside of the shuttle mm -hmm. as well. So um, uh, um, a company called Commonplace is providing that, that sentiment okay. mapping, which we think might well also be adopted by some of the other uh, research Can you projects. elaborate on that at this point, or is, it, is that all behind closed doors in terms of how you're kind of monitoring the human behaviours? Um, part of what is going to be, part, part of the initial stage of, of the research is actually going to be setting out exactly how we're going to be doing the, okay. uh, the research. So, so there's quite a lot of methodology still to be developed mm -hmm. before we really start testing in earnest. And, and really how we go about interacting with, with um, uh, occupants of, of vehicles and, and those around um, is to be defined. But as okay. I say, we, we're, we're going to be using platforms like uh, that that Commonplace provide to, to understand these, these sentiments that people are expressing. Okay. expressing. 
uh, th through social media platforms and through uh, sort of sp specific data capture um, uh, facilities as well that we'll be having within Greenwich. Okay. Well, I could sit and talk about this all day, um, but I think that's a really good point to, to end on there. But uh, thanks for sharing, and I can't wait to hear the update next year. No problem. Thanks, Athena.